everybody, it's Tom, and this week I want to discuss the question of social ecology. Social ecology being a movement which originated in the late 50s, the early 60s. We can attach a few different names to its origin. In a moment, I'd like to recall specifically Murray Bookchin among those figures, uh, also a noted figure in American anarchism. So toward the latter portion of his life, he started to distance himself from the anarchist label, specifically for what he identified as a trend of lifestyle anarchism, where uh, the preoccupation with the private subject, the singular individual, had undercut the central value of solidarity, which had informed the anarchist tradition from really its inception, most pronouncedly in the 19th and early 20th century. This tendency is, in, in fact, be related to the main body of our discussion, but still has the aspect of tangent. So we're going to bracket that for a moment and return to social ecology. And I want to return to social uh, ecology by summarizing the inspiration for topic choice. And the inspiration for the topic choice was running recently upon an article which wanted us to give a fairer consideration of a view known as anti-natalism. Anti-natalism is the perspective, simply enough, that human beings should cease from having children and in fact even drive ourselves to extinction in that way grounds itself, uh, can ground itself in different ways. The two main ways in which it can ground itself are to indict the human species as something which is almost alien or at the very least parasitic with respect to the life of the planet altogether and as such something which should be removed from the planet. On the other hand, the uh, complementary, if you like, the perversely com complementary view that life is a thing of such suffering that uh, it isn't worth the bother, if you like. And below, I attempt to sort of meet those issues in a, a written blog, but we're not going to get so much into that today. Because frankly, the anti- position is an extreme position and you're not I believe happily not going to find very many people who are really going to take that up with any earnestness but in a muted form the presuppositions which are used to ground that anti-natalist perspective are operative in more common views especially within segments of the community concerned rightfully concerned environmental and ecological crisis. And what are those presuppositions? Well, not merely a kind of philosophical misanthropy, though that's certainly part of it, but also a particular notion of nature or the wilderness, where there is a kind of framing of, the na of nature or the wilderness as something which is pristine, Part or distinct from human society, human being. It's something which we can, as such, exploit as something which is coming at it from outside of it. This is a view which really, well, I would say most immediately inherit from the Enlightenment. And you can see this, for example, in the framing of the project of science that we receive from René Descartes uh, in his Discourse on Method, where he identifies the real basis of science as being to grant us a lordship, a mastery of control over nature, so that we can accentuate our pleasure and diminish our pain and even perhaps evade our mortality. say it like that, <laughs> uh, to most people I think, when you say it like that, they 
is sort of thrown into quick relief with the problem of viewing nature in that way as something to be you know, dominated, controlled, manipulated, submitted to our will. However, there are more benign ways in which, or more seemingly benign ways, in which to offer the same basic trope. So for instance, you can look at American Transcendentalism, a figure like Henry David Thoreau. And Thoreau is a thinker, a writer, with whom I resonate a great deal. But if you read, well not just Walden, but say in a briefer piece, his essay on walking, you have a kind of glorification of the wilderness, the, some, the, the wildness of the wilderness, it's untouched nature apart from human hand as something uh, worthy of almost mystical contemplation. But despite the aesthetic differential here uh, between what you're going to find in someone like Thoreau or someone like Descartes, you have the same basic casting of the world at large as something which is apart from us. And uh, that invites a kind of dualism, not a metaphysical dualism, but I'm just sort of using the word in a more general way, but at the very least a uh, separateness which encourages antagonism. And... Uh, and that antagonism perhaps forecloses the possibility of human beings participating in the solutions to the environmental and the ecological catastrophes, which uh, in a way we are inviting. This is an appropriate point at which to come back to Murray Bookchin. Murray Bookchin was quite explicit in saying, look, no longer look at nature in this way. Is this, uh, whether you want to look at it as an inert other or as a mystical other, as in sometimes is found as he would decry within uh, New Age communities, the Gaia hypothesis and all the rest of that. What we have to realize is that nature is not a static other. Nature is a process or a aggregate an ensemble of innumerable processes and among those processes within the sphere of life itself we can look at the trajectory of evolution and what happens within that trajectory of evolution what happens within that trajectory is the emergence over time of organisms increasing subjectivity flexibility, and engagement with their environment. And when I say engagement with their environment, what I am directing our attention towards, sorry, I was trying not to <laughs> dangle a preposition there, but I, know I fell into it, but to what I'm trying to draw our attention and to what Bookchin was drawing our attention is that you have a transformation in the relationship between the organism and the environment. Whereas instead of merely reacting or adapting to that environment with increasing subjectivity, flexibility, sophistication, the organism creates that environment. Or there's a kind of co-creation there. There's a dialectical interchange between the individual and its and, 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 and its world. And this on our planet in any event sees a kind of particularly incredible uh, demonstration in the case of human beings, in the case of you and I, where our Sophisticated sentience has granted us uh, just really an incredibly unique relationship, still a dialectical relationship, but a unique relationship 
with this environment, with the other entities that share this, this world with us. What is to be noted is that we weren't just thrown into this world. We emerged from it. We emerged from nature. We are part of nature. And in this regard, those aspects of human life which framings which dismiss us as being in an innately violent relationship with the natural world those uh, you know things like cities and agriculture things which are very distinctively human or at least very distinctively human insofar as uh, we've taken them to extraordinary levels of development or cultivation these things are natural because we from, we're from nature, and by extension, they too are part of nature. And what this does is it actually, rather than diminishes our responsibility, enhances our responsibility. What the apprehension of the continuity between the human being and natural being does is dissolve alienation, which is latent in the prior which I was describing. The alienation, which in extreme forms is invoked to justify absurdities like antinatalism, but in more muted ways kind of blinds us to the fact that we have to realize that the root of the problem resides then Termination of our species, but in the transformation of how we relate with each other. Because it's in how we relate with each other that we have created a system of being that has cascaded into truly terrible developments. Developments like the devastation of the tropical rainforests of the world threatening of the Arctic, subarctic spheres, recently uh, further intensified by the reopening of oil drilling. Um, and, you know, the, the list goes on. I, d I don't think I need to provide one for you here. I'm sure you're more than aware of all sorts of unfortunate things in that respect. And, and so... This latter analysis is where I'm saying, let's remember what Murray Bookchin was telling us, because he really kind of originated this idea. And he went beyond it to say, okay, once you grasp that the problem lies in the social domain, let's be more specific about what is amiss in the social domain. And in part, the problem is that of capitalism, a system of economy which compels us to exist not merely in terms of stratified class, but to exist in a way which which distorts our relationship with time and space, and an obsession with speed, acceleration, growth, compromises our ability to exist in a truly dialectical or harmonious or continuous relationship with at large from which we actually emerged. But even more fundamentally, which then goes on to advance than the capitalist system of economy, is the problem of hierarchy and the problem of orchestrating our societies along lines which give more power to some and less power to others in a radically differential manner. This maldistribution of power occurs not just along an economic axis, but it occurs along, say, for instance, the axis of gender, patriarchy. It occurs along an, exist, an axis of race, so you can look at treatment of African Americans. You can look at it along terms of ethnicity, historically, for instance, you see the pariah 
Aquarius status, which was uh, visited upon people of Jewish descent. Um, that's just one example. What occurs is that as a society institutes and ossifies hierarchical relationships within it, attitudes, the values, the viewpoints of the people within that society, whether they be on the top or lower portions of it, are um, twisted in a way that their relationship with others and with the world becomes merely instrumental. It's merely something to be used and people are merely something to be used. And that inversion be a more appropriate relationship of mean and ends gives rise to violence of one variety or another. And that violence at the end of the day is what has given us what's wrong with the world at this time. If we want to do away with the violence, the suggestion offered by Bookchin, a suggestion which I second to begin evaluating why we permit hierarchy and maldistribution of power to uh, abide so pervasively in our world. And, you know, it's easy to see this in terms of corporations and states and governments, but it actually starts on a very basic scale in terms of how we relate with each other. And, uh, and, and I guess that's where we have to begin. The work is with each other right here, right now. Do I permit myself to stand in a dominant or submissive relationship to other people in my immediate environment? What does that mean? What are those implications? What are those implications for my friendships? For my familial sphere? For the workplace? And, you know, one could go on. I'm already at 1725, so I'm not going to go on any further. And in a way, it's appropriate to end here, to end here with questions. Because if all of a sudden you become fixated on the answer, game's over, right? Even though sometimes we arrive at answers, they're ultimately only steps on a staircase to something which is even, an even greater answer. And, and I, that's, where, that's where I'm going to leave you. Day. Now, with that point, if you go ahead and ask the question of how does power work out in my own life? And am I living in a way which represents fidelity to human egality? <laughs> it's a caveat. <laughs> I'm not pretending to be a perfect exemplar of that ideal. It's something to which I am striving, to which we all must strive together. I think if we do that consistently, all of a sudden, almost magically, we'll start finding new ways of approaching all sorts of problems, including those of the environment and ecology. With that, once again, this has been Tom Lynn talking to you today about social ecology, pointing you in the direction of Murray Bookchin, and thanking you for listening. And if it's been of any value, please go ahead, subscribe to my page. And uh, we will hopefully keep bringing these videos to you. Uh, coming up, we talked about this very interesting chap, Gaston Bachelard. A great little book, uh, The Poetics of Space. La Poétique de l'Espace, I think is the French. And anyway, that's all for now. And I'll catch you next week.